I'm like, oh my gosh, there are all these things around, but how come I don't know any of it? <laughs> and then so in the three months, I hit the payment, I hit the internet, I start learning, and then I, I do low carb, I did intermittent fasting, I dropped by 23 pounds without exercise. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Welcome to the Fat Emperor Podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Hey, Dr. Andy Fong, how are you doing? Hello, Ivor. How are you? Ah, not too bad. Busy, busy and uh, kept going. But uh, great to talk to you this evening and catch up. And you've been out on Twitter. I've only noticed you the last few weeks. We've had a couple of chats. But now you're trying to get out on Twitter to get out the message of how you can actually resolve metabolic disease in your patients quite easily. That's true. Yeah, I, uh, I started about a month ago. And um, I actually started the, the low carb uh, and intermittent fasting about two years ago. And getting really good results, but have no way to put it out. So I was like, well, maybe I should share the good news with, you know, more people. And so that's why I took to Twitter, Twitter about a month ago. Excellent. Yeah, well, I've seen I noticed you pretty quickly. I know you tagged me, but all of these dramatic graphs of insulin coming down over a period of weeks, dramatically fasting insulin, weights coming down. So you're really excited about actually really helping people now compared to just giving them some pills. Absolutely. You know, um, I, I mean, um, I didn't notice myself until uh, like two years ago. And then so before that is, you know, I practice traditional medicine, traditional training. So we diagnose, we write them a pill, give them a prescription. <laughs> So, and I did that for like seven years uh, after uh, residency. So, um, you do what you know, and that was, that was what I knew, you know. Yeah, and you in residency and indeed in, in college doing medicine, I guess there was no real focus on hyperinsulinemia and metabolic syndrome and, and how it connects to the majority of modern disease. Any, any of that stuff? Not really. What they do talk about is um, in, I call them the Western medicine, is uh, organ systems, you know, that divide the heart um, in isolation, the lungs in isolation, the muscle in isolation. So, so, um, so when you see these tiny pieces and we say, well, but the problem is the body doesn't work like that. You know, you can't just say, well, okay, I'll take the heart out and just study the heart. And well, that's what they do, you know. So, so that's what we were taught, you know. And then so that's what I practiced for a long time. So, Yeah, that's interesting, actually. There's an element of piecemeal to it, all the piece parts, but not the integrated whole. Funny enough, in engineering as well, if there's a massive project that's really complex, a new product development, there are many, many specialties for different pieces of the technology, but one of our most important people is the integration lead. And that person, yeah, that person has pretty good depth in nearly all the technology areas and can actually integrate or tie together all of the pieces when a major issue arises, where the individual specialists kind of get lost. That's so. exactly what happened. And then so... Uh, it's not that, you know, we didn't know a lot of the stuff that we talk about. We do know. And, you know, but because you, because what you need is you need to do something, I call them the connection. And then, but, but because there was no one to show you the connection, you only know that, hey, you know, this is the heart, this is the lung, this is the kidney, do this for the lung, do this for the heart. And then so, um, so, I mean, one thing they did say in medical school is that no one comes in with a diagnosis on their forehead stamp, because if it is stamp, you just write them a pill. <laughs> so you need to come up with a diagnosis. And that's what we're really good with. Oh, this is what's wrong with you. Here's a pill for you. Oh, this is what's wrong for you. Here's two pills for you. And that's what we were taught to do. And, and, and you know, we're really good at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, for, for certain afflictions, you know, that, that'll work pretty well. Good identification of the problem and target a modern pharmaceutical solution 
and uh, it works for a lot of things, but I guess not for the the kind of epidemic of chronic disease is poorly served by that approach. That approach works really well for I call them acute disease, something that comes in, you know what's going on, and you say here's an antibiotic, or here's something else, and then it it goes away. It doesn't stay. But you know, when we're talking about chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, and things like that, they don't go away. They stay, and year after year after year, we just like, well, here's medicine for you. Just take it. You know, that's what we have. Yeah. So you had a road to Damascus conversion a couple of years ago. You actually realized and put all the pieces together with some help from some people out there, I guess, and and people you learn from. So maybe briefly go run through your uh, conversion. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, um, I have a family history of diabetes. You know, I was carrying about 25 pounds, a little bit more. But it doesn't show because I'm Asian, so it's only in the midsection. So um, you know what I know before that was calorie in, calorie out. You know, exercise. If you want to lose weight and eat less, you'll really lose weight, and it does work. Um, but the catch for me was before that, many many years ago, I was already running and try to be in shape and not to gain weight, and then but develop foot pain, and then. And then what happened was I developed di- pre-diabetes on top of the foot pain. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? Exercise even more? Eating even less? I'm like, I can't do this. Um, but, you know, uh, what I was, um, I was like, you know, I have to do something. So um, I got an elliptical machine where there's no pounding the pavement anymore. But I said, okay, I need to exercise. I need to exercise every night. So I go to work, come back, get on elliptical for like an hour. And then, um, and then um, watch the, um, I think it's called the Top Gear, the UK, the UK version. They have so many. On, I watch all of them, all the seasons, like a show after show after show while doing my elliptical, right? And then I did it for a whole year. I went in 172 pounds. I left 172 pounds. I was like, God, I didn't lose any weight. And my sugar barely budged. My A1C was 5'8 to begin with. Now it's 5'6, but I didn't lose any weight. And then at around the same time, my sister sent me a link about Dr. Jason Fung, you know, the famous one in Canada, <laughs> said, hey, you can reverse diabetes. I'm like, no way. He said, no, yes, you can. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is bull because I'm not that old. I just graduated from medical school and, and then I did my residency. I only been out for six to seven years. I know my stuff, okay? I go to CME, I go to conferences, I, I keep everything up to date. It's not possible because diabetes is a chronic progressive disease and it's written in big bold letters <laughs> i know my stuff okay <laughs> but then in the back of my mind i'm like come on you were pre-diabetic you exercised for a whole year you didn't lose any weight maybe there's nothing to lose <laughs> so so i um i watch his video it's called i think the um the two compartment syndrome um talking about how the um uh how the biggest loser, they went in, they exercise, they eat less, and boom, their weight came back. And then he started talking about insulin. I was like, oh, I know insulin, <laughs> that's easy. Um, the shot you give yourself, yeah, anybody who's diabetic, go on insulin, will get fat, and I know that, okay? That's not new. But then he said, oh no, it's the refined carbohydrates, the sugar, and the starch. They spike your insulin really high comparing to the protein of fat. I'm like, no, no. I'm Asian. I eat rice, a lot of rice. Oh my gosh, that's what's driving my obesity. <laughs> and then so, um, so, so at that time, I was like, wow, I need to learn a lot more. And I ordered his book, uh, the, the first book, The Obesity Co., and started reading that. And then I found another book that he wrote, The, um, the, guide to, uh, the Ultimate Guide to Fasting. I read that too. And then start going on the internet more and then watch all the videos. And, 
and start seeing Dr. Hyman. I don't know if you heard Mark Hyman from um, yep. the Hyman Clinic. And he also talked about that. I'm like, oh my gosh, there are all these things around, but how come I don't know any of it? <laughs> and then so in the three months, I hit the pavement, I hit the internet, I start learning, and then I, I do low carb, I did intermittent fasting, I dropped by 23 pounds without exercise. I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then I was like, okay, what are you going to do with your patients? <laughs> Uh, you know, they still diabetic, you're still writing pills, what are you going to do about it? Um, but the good news is because I was learning so much more, I start feeling comfortable to start prescribing to my patient. So that was like almost two years ago. Wow. So that's, and that is a classic story, uh, broadly speaking, of, of the tens, hundreds of thousands, soon millions, who will be learning what you learned. But it's even more interesting when you're, you know, a professional doctor, not long out of college, residency, and this can be such a revelation to you. So it's a fascinating. I can't say, can't say more, you know. Um, we were taught the old model, which is like calorie in, calorie out, you know. Um, um, carb has four calories, protein has four calories, fat has nine calories. Don't be stupid. Don't put too much calorie in your body. You'll get fat. <laughs> and, then, and then if you worry about fat, burn your calories, exercise. And then so that's what I was told. And I was like, you know, you, you yeah. do what you're told, you know, or at least you do what you're taught. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's exactly it, Andy. The calories in, calories out. The fat has more calories. It's going to make you fat. All complete. BS science, but sounds convincing. And the beauty of, of bad science, I often find, is it can actually sound pretty intuitive and simple. And it's a, it's a dead giveaway. If it sounds simplistic, and if food companies and people like that love the theory, you got to start questioning it. So you got the answers. But you know, this evening in our chat, I'd love to hear some of the patient stories. You've done really great two years ago, you got it, and now you deploy it with your patients. So maybe two things, a few stories, and also how it makes you feel as a doctor compared to your old regime. Sure. I mean, the old regime is, um, you know, if patients have prediabetes, well, first thing we tell people like, hey, eat less, exercise more, I'll see you in three months. And then they come back three months later, the sugar might come down a little bit and you say, okay, we'll see you in three more months. And then sugar creeps that back up. We're like, well, metformin for you. Here you go. Two times a day. We'll see you in three months. And then, you know, shortly after, well, sugar goes up again. Well, <laughs> we need another medicine. Well, metformin's not enough. And we're like, and then we stop talking about exercise because it doesn't work. <laughs> so so we're, we're, we're like, okay, fine. You know, here's another pill for you. And then one pill becomes two, two becomes three. And next thing you know, it's like, well, it's not enough to keep your A1C under seven anymore. I'm using all the pills I know. And, um, and here you go. Insulin starts. And then um, usually the nighttime insulin. And then the patients get, fatter by the second and then they get sicker by the time and you know what can you say you know you're doing what you're told and the patient gets sick so you're like well uh, it's in big bowl letter it's chronic progressive disease just tell them to suck it up that's what they have to do and then which is really sad and then so what what that's what i was taught and that's what i practiced for like seven years so <clears throat> Oh, yeah. And, you know, I suppose in that kind of scenario, when you're comfortable that you you do understand the technology, you've got it right. They're not succeeding at all. Therefore, they must be a bit lazy and not applying themselves. Exactly. So um, so there are two ways to think about when they are not succeeding. Um, you can say, well, you know, you're not succeeding because you didn't listen to me well enough. You didn't exercise hard enough. You didn't eat less enough. You didn't do what I asked you to do. So that's what we always say as a rationale for why they're not succeeding. But when it's you, when it's you having to carry some extra weight, when it's you having prediabetes, when it's you exercise already, 
you start really questioning what you're doing because anyone else doing it, you can always say, hey, they're not doing what I asked them. So how can I, how can they prove to you, right? But when it's you doing what you prescribe to your patient and that doesn't work, oh my gosh, you start, oh, yes, it, 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 when you see the light, oh my gosh, the door is like wide open, so. Excellent. And if we could look or talk about a couple of your patients, then you have a couple of pretty stunning successes. Well, many successes that you've posted, but a couple of the guys, there's a hundred pound weight loss in a year and, and insulin moving like a rocket downwards. So maybe a few of those. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so, um, what the first one is the, uh, uh, I called the bypass a patient. <laughs> and then so what happened was like, um, I got a letter from his surgeon after I learned the low carb intermittent fasting, what drives, um, you know, um, uh, obesity and all that, um, insulin, by the way. <clears throat> and I'm like, so I got a letter from his surgeon say, hey, we're going to do surgery on your patient to lose weight. And, and by the way, here's what I tell them to cut back on his calories and exercise more. And I'm like, no. Don't do it because that's bullshit. <laughs> I know what it is. So, so I pick up the phone and call him. I said, hey, you know, I, um, I got a letter from your surgeon said you want to get, you know, stomach surgery for some weight problem. And plus, I haven't seen you in some time. So why don't you come in to see me, you know, get some blood work done before you come because I think you have an insulin problem. And then, um, and then, um, you know, talk to him, I think it was like an hour on the phone just after work and, and then try to convince him it's the right thing to do. And he came in, got some blood work done. And that was like um, about eight months before the, the last time I saw him. And he weighed 295 pounds. And then, you know, insulin was quite high. And I'm like, okay, here you go. I'm going to blow your bubble. <laughs> it's not about calorie in, about calorie out. It's all about insulin. It's all about insulin resistance. It's about what insulin do to your body. It's, um, it's the insulin driving the fat accumulation. It's the insulin preventing the fat metabolism. So to fix your problem, we have to fix insulin. And so... To fix insulin is that because the refined carbohydrate and starch does drive the insulin the most, so we have to do low carbohydrate diet. And then so now is the boo boo. Well, you mean I need to eat more fat? But doctor, fat's gonna cause heart disease, don't you know? <laughs> And now I'm like, oh, yes, I do know. But it's not about fat anymore, about the particle of the cholesterol. And then, and then so, but that, that was another story. So I started him on this low-carb, high-fat, intermittent fasting. He started at like 295 pounds within about six months. He went down like 75 pounds. Right now he's at 220. And then if you look at his... Um, um, advanced cholesterol test. The main one is like the ratio of triglyceride to HDL. Triglyceride come from carb, HDL come from fat, and you start seeing the numbers drop, like um, you know, the ratio was like about one to, uh, one to six, and it dropped to one to three. So, um, so basically cut down a lot of the, the carbohydrate. And then um, what people might not know is the, the VLDL. The VLDL is synthesized by the liver to carry the triglyceride out. And, and the triglyceride uh, made from the refined carbohydrates. Oh, my light went out. I don't know if it still works. Okay. Um, so, um, so the next thing I looked at is the VLDL. VLDL is synthesized by the liver. It's a lipoprotein particle. It is made to carry the triglyceride away from the liver to the adipose tissue. And the triglyceride from the liver come from the refined carbohydrate and the sugar. So if you look at his VLDL, it starts out around 20. That means he's making a ton of triglyceride from his refined carbohydrate. And it went from 20 down to 11, and the last was like 3. And a normal is less than 2.7. So that's how much triglyceride or 
that he didn't make, that the body didn't need to make the VLDL to transport it out. And those VLDLs, I sometimes describe to people to simplify, it's the mother of LDL. That's right. It's Yeah, and the LDL particle comes when a VLDL shrinks. But that's fantastic because that was in a fasting test, I guess. That, uh, yes, it is in the fasting test. Yeah. So that guy had all those VLDL swamping around in his blood and he gets down to almost the target. That's right. And then, um, and then the advanced cholesterol test, it also gives you something called the, um, the lipoprotein insulin resistance score. Like um, he maxed out at 100 when he started. And then, wow. Yeah, it went from 100 down to 85 and the last is uh, 66. And then um, if you look at his... Um, um, look at his insulin level. We start out at 16.9, went down to 15.5 and 4.4. So when he was 295 pounds, his insulin was sky high at 16.9. And now he's at 220. It's 4.4 fasting. Under five, which is a really good number. And of course, all that insulin needed to be pumped out for the carb he was eating and also to hold back his fat cells from actually shedding to hold back all those fats. But now he's actually reached a pretty good place, but he's still on his journey. He's still moving. Absolutely. We're not there yet. <laughs> um, so um, um, I only did one A1C number to, to begin with. It was like 5.4. Um, basically, he was really good at converting his carb into triglycerides. So the A1C was good. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, forget it. I'm not checking anymore. <laughs> Um, so he was like, uh, um, but the other one I checked was the uh, high sense of C-reactive protein. For him, it was a little bit jumpy. Um, it didn't really come down, but I was also told that it's a little bit more um, like an acute, uh, it tend to change, um, fluctuate more. So, um, but certainly he still have a lot to do with that one, but he also travels too. So, um I'm thinking he might be consuming some alcohol in there too that could be driving the, uh, the high sense of C-reactive protein. Yeah, well, he's done really well, but I mean, of course, he's on a journey. He may be occasionally doing a little bit of cheating and, and also persistent, like decades-long damage to the machine. Like his lipo IR is still very high. It can take a lot of fasting and pretty extreme measures to try and fix something that's been under such a, a abuse for so long. So, yeah, it sounds like he's on a great vector, though. And he's happy as hell, I'd say. Yeah, he, uh, I told him, I'm like, look, you owe me $25,000 because that's what you were going to do. <laughs> Get your stomach surgery done. <laughs> Hey, actually, Ad, you told me that the other night when we had a call. Uh, if you could just get eight people like that and save eight twenty-five Ks, you got your yearly salary for eight patients. I know, I know, but unfortunately, that's not how the healthcare system works. So, um, no, I get my, uh, you know, um, my average um, whatever bill that I put out, and that's all I got, you know. But, uh, yeah. but hey, you know, money doesn't fix everything, and and so, um, but I'm really happy for him. Hey guys, just a quick break to remind you that this podcast is only possible due to funding from the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity and its founder, David Bobbitt. David discovered he had massive heart disease in 2012 and could only do so by getting a five-minute calcification scan and CAC score. It enabled him to take action to stop the disease process and to save his own life. Now he is spending millions to help others do likewise. All we ask is to help get the message out on the power of CAC, Watch the Widowmaker movie linked at the end of this podcast and share it as widely as you can. Thank you. And now we return to the conversation. Excellent. And you have another person there. I think you were thinking one of your other star pupils. Absolutely. Here's another one. He came in and, and um, he was quite heavy and he had fatty liver. And I said, well... I know why you have fatty liver. It comes from your food. <laughs> and, and so um, um, it, in about 12 months, um, we started out at 305 pounds. We went down to uh, 210 pounds, so roughly 100 pounds in a year. And then so um, if you look at his numbers, um, again, you know, um, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, triglyceride, it was started out at, uh, which is carb, 
come from carb at 183 went down to the last was 103 and the ratio of triglyceride to um, HDL was like one to about 3.6 and right now is at one, or, uh, one and uh, 2.3. And then uh, for this man, uh, his VLDL wasn't as bad as the other one at 30, but it was at 10 to begin with, so quite high. And the last time we measured it was the VLDL went down to less than 0 0.8. And if you look at his insulin resistance, the LPIR, he was in the middle range at 50th percentile, now it's under 25. So it's like great, you know, um, you can't get less than 25. So. Yeah, and you know, Andy, the lipo IR from the advanced lipoprotein panel that you've mentioned there, uh, that's a really good metric. That is a really accurate indicator. And what they use is they use the sizes of the particles and other numbers. But uh, even though it's a kind of an advanced cholesterol test and they're using cholesterol particle measures, to be honest, some of the best data you can get from cholesterol particle sizes and distributions is the degree of insulin resistance. That's right. So it's, That's, a, it's a great measure. So I, I tend to use that a lot as a motivation um, to, um, to get people to change. And then um, so most of the time, you know, when you look at that um, uh, lipo IR is um, the 45, which is the 50th percentile. And some people would say, well, doctor, I'm happy at 45. I'm like, no, it's crap. It's average. Average will sink you. You want, you want great. You don't want average. So that's a way to well, motivate people. Yeah, you could tell them, well, if you're happy having the average heart attack rate and the average cancer rate, right, and the average diabetes and obesity of an average American, Okay, knock yourself out. Yeah, I know, I know. You don't want to be average. You want to be great. So, um, so for this man, uh, when we started at 310 pounds, he, uh, he was making fasting insulin at 20.4. It went from 20.4 to 16.6 to 13.8, and the last was 8.2. So he's not quite at five, but he dropped 100 pounds already. And then so um, I think we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think below six is fantastic, particularly for a previously metabolically deranged person. But for someone with long-term issues who's lost a lot of weight and their metrics are going great, you know, getting even down to eight from 20 is, is a superb job. So big shout out there to that guy. We won't name him. He, he's doing great. And then, uh, you know, initially, uh, his um, average sugar, the A1C was at, at 310 pounds. He was, he was pre-diabetic, 5.7. And then uh, after dropping 100 pounds, he, now he's at 4.8. And then, mm. so that's really, really good. Wow, that is, that is excellent. And again, the HbA1c, you know, you can be very, very diabetic and it still looks okay. But I mean, with a fasting insulin at 20, we can only imagine what his post glucose insulin would have been or post meal be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've heard somebody said um, about the, um, the post meal insulin goes like this. Doesn't matter whether you're skinny or fat. Um, a skinny one, if you eat a meal, you'll make five to seven times the insulin. If you're a fat man, you or a fat person or woman, doesn't matter, you'll still make five to seven times the insulin. But what determines your basal insulin is how much fat you carry. So if you think about that, then he, he started out at 20. 20 times five, his insulin is 200 post meal. Could be anything like that. Dr. Jeff Gerber, I remember his record as a guy, his two hour insulin after 75 grams glucose uh, ingested was 530 micro units. Yeah, I'm trying to incorporate the two hours here. I'm not there yet trying to find those sugar, but um, having a hard time. So I'm just using the fasting insulin for now. And then obviously using other biomarkers to tell me what their diet has been. So trying to move them to the right direction. Yeah. And I think in fairness, Andy, you're kind of a firefighter of the medical world. You're dealing with people with major issues 
and just getting them to relative safety as quickly as possible. Um, but you must be inundated like in America. You're East Coast, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, you must be, I mean, what percentage of your patients come in who are not overweight and have very good blood markers, very healthy? <laughs> not very good, actually. Um, adults. I mean, children are bad already, but adults. I actually had a, a lady who came in and said, yeah, my dad was um, diabetic and and I was a little bit fat, uh, but I, I cut out my junk food already. And she said, my weight is normal. And I checked her um, fasting and it was like 25. I was like, no, aren't you supposed to be normal weight? You know, her BMI and everything was normal. But her fasting insulin was very high and her, uh, um, and her um, uh, inflammation was like eight, the HSCRP. And I'm like, oh no, you're the skinny fat one now. So now I need to get you in and to say, to review your, you know, what you eat and trying to fix that too. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you have to be fat to have the disease, these metabolic diseases. You can be thin and still have the same disease too. And then so that's what most people don't know is that um, you can be thin and still die of a heart attack. You can be thin and still die of a stroke. Um, but, um, you know, nowadays we just say, well, the fat one have disease. Well, I like, know you will have it too if you eat bad. Well, actually, that is a great point, and it's worth stressing again and again. Uh, the biggest tragedy is if someone's really overweight or they smoke and they know they break the rules and they do develop atherosclerosis and have a heart attack, it's tragic, but at least they're not under any illusions. They, they know they're doing everything wrong. But the real bigger tragedies in ways are the middle-aged men or women have a heart attack and die and they were slim like you say they didn't smoke and they they felt that they ate healthy lots of whole grains and vegetable oils they didn't know that that stuff is terrible so it's a really important point that uh yeah we got to get the message out to people truly if you really want to know what middle age if you've got disease you want to look and see the calcification scan a quick cac scan and and then you get your answer I, I've been trying to get people to get the calcium scan too. And then I have one scan so far. Um, he's, I think he's like 46. He said, um, it came back zero. So I'm like, well, but your inflammation, HSCRP is four. And your, uh, and your um, other mount markers, your triglycerides still high, your HDL is still low. Well, what does it really mean? Well, you're still going to kill your artery. <laughs> You don't have any damage now, but if you don't change, you're gonna have it. So, um, so, um, so at Ex least, uh, at least he might want to say, okay, I don't have the plaque, or at least we don't see the plaque now. But you have inflammation, literally burning in your arteries, and so you have to fix the root cause of why you're having all these inflammations. So ultimately, is that people have to feel the urgency for them to change and then so um yes uh, so not all my stories are great um i have some people it's like you know dragging and then pulling and coercing and still don't get the results so um you know ultimately it comes down to uh self-determination you know that's what i tell my patients they knew the truth and how to fix it they'd take action that's that's a lot of people that's a lot and yes yeah exactly and and this this is a battle and uh it's gonna be hard but uh when everyone knows the truth like you learned two years ago the effect of everyone and all medical people and everyone knowing that seed oils and sugars and refined carbs are causing most of the disease uh will be huge we're talking just enormous just on the point there, yeah, about CAC, and I like the way you put that. Right now, you have minimal plaque. But if your blood markers show that you've got an issue, you know, the CAC just means you're lucky so far. That's and right. There, 
Yeah. So there's great studies which show that a CAC of zero in someone with reasonable blood markers for 15 years, there's going to be a relatively very low heart heart attack rate. But for the people in the group who have any diabetes or bad blood markers, it showed that the warranty, if you will, or the low rates only last for two or three years. So a zero combined with good blood markers and doing the right thing, super. But a zero with bad blood markers, not so much high LDL or high cholesterol, but real ones like you've been discussing, that just means, you know, you have a short time maybe before you might have an event, but you could have a CAC of 20 or 30 in a year. You could have a CAC of 70 or 80 in two years. You know, that, that CAC could be going up above zero any day now. That's right. And then, you know, um, and then if you really, really do look deep about, you know, these um, heart events or coronary events, it comes down to, you know, endothelial damage, the cells that line those tiny blood vessels. And if you, I mean, if anybody who, who wants to know a lot about uh, endothelial damage, Dr. Kraft has a great book, you know, on the, I think it's called the the diabetes and you, and he goes through a lot. And he said, look, if someone who died of a heart attack and wasn't diabetic, they are diabetic, just not diagnosed. And if you go to look at the septum of the, of the, of the ventricle, they are damaged to those small capillaries. But, you know, it's hard to convince people when they, <laughs> you know, when they don't, don't think like that. So. Yeah, I think in fairness, Dr. Kraft, yeah, did some fantastic work. And I guess, yeah, the, the idea, I suppose most heart disease links in some manner to diabetes, not all, because you could have an inflammatory condition mm -hmm. like lupus that could mm -hmm. damage your endothelium. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, in the modern world, the latest figures from Europe, over 70% of all ages coronary artery disease victims, when you look closely with glucose metrics, they're essentially diabetic. And if you used insulin, it could be 80 or 90%. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, um, so the big thing is, you know, yeah, it could be other conditions like autoimmune that could be causing, you know, the heart disease, but that is a very small slice in the population, you know, but the rest of them is insulin, insulin resistance, you know, so, you know, Yes, it's important to fix everyone, but fix the big part first, you know. So that's what I tell patients. Yeah, well, that, that is an engineering logic and, and absolutely. And when we talk to people about cholesterol, I suppose the frustration is that cholesterol has a part to play in heart disease. But the huge irony is that most of the problems that cholesterol causes in the atherosclerosis issue are in turn driven by other causes. So it's just so distracting to look at something that's part of the process, but it's not the core for most people. Um, but still, people got to watch if their cholesterol numbers and particularly ratios jump around, you know, if they change their diet and things go funny, you got to look close or you got to have a great doctor like Dr. Andy Fung looking at you. <laughs> uh, I, I don't even care about LDL anymore. I care about... Um, HDL, I care about triglyceride, I care about small cholesterol particle, um, and I, I care about the LPIR, that's what I really care. And then obviously the, um, the VLDL, because that VLDL catch a lot of cheaters around <laughs> because they say, I don't eat badly. We're like, well, why is that? there so many VLDLs around? It, it may to ship your triglyceride out. And then, but so that, that's a way to, um, I wouldn't call it cheaters, I would say, um, non-conformers at times. <laughs> I sometimes think of drifters because even the best of us, you know, you can drift a little, you got a lot of stress, busy at work. People can drift. And the, the main thing is to get them back on track, you know, encourage them. That, that's what we, we have to do. And then, you know, and the more you look at it is, um, um, they actually start having like, um, MI imaging, functional MI imaging um, that, uh, that shows the area called the nucleus accumbent that triggers the something called dopamine, it, the addiction center of the brain. 
and and unfortunately that thing is triggered by everything that's bad <laughs> it triggered by tobacco it triggered by alcohol it triggered by illicit drugs and sugar and carb the same thing so when you think about that it's like don the food that we thought is good is actually addicted <laughs> so that's why when people um quote fall off the low carb wagon they don't want to come back because that food is holding them back because it makes them feel good and then so so that's the uh, that's the the lecture i tend to give for people who did well then fall then quote fell off and i'm like hey you want to see your brain why you didn't want to come back to low carb <laughs> and then so that's what i use yeah yeah it is dangerous falling off the wagon a little you you get caught in that addictive kind of cycle and then you need a certain activation energy or escape velocity to break back out of it and it, it is tough it, it's never really the people's fault there are some small percentage of people who are greedy and indulgent i mean there are some but mostly these people really want to be more slim they want to feel better they're worried about their health and their children and whether they're going to be around most people want to live they just don't know the tricks and the secrets. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. So, um, so for me, when I when I uh, work with my patients, I don't just tell them the food is bad. No, it doesn't work. You can't tell people, "Hey, it's bad. Don't eat this. Eat that." I tell them. I show them the mechanisms. I like to doodle. <laughs> I, I I draw it out. I say, "Hey, this is what happens when you eat this. This is what happens when you eat that. Insulin here, insulin here, no insulin here." So I show them the mechanisms of how the food affects their physiology, because ultimately they have to understand what the food do to their body for them to stay on why they need to change. That is. Uh, occurred to me uh, some time ago, way back, that knowing what happens, not in huge scientific detail, but just knowing what happens when the wrong foods come into your body and what they do and visualizing it, even for a non-technical layperson, it helps so much when you reach out for that croissant or you reach out maybe to take that those those chocolates or sweets and then you you know that'll go in it's going to flare up in my upper intestine my insulin's going to go up i'm going to head back into possibly this addictive you know merry-go-round and, and then it might just help them just not do it that's right so yeah. And so yeah knowing the mechanism is really really i think crucial um, for the patients who are doing well the ones who are not doing well you know um Every patient who comes in to see me with these chronic diseases, I always have some kind of lesson or at least some kind of talk that I have watched. And then I'm like, hey, go home and watch this. This is what we talked about. And then for the one who succeed, I think they do their homework at home. For the one who haven't succeed, I'm not sure if they are doing it or they just, ah, you know, I don't think I believe they're just throwing the trash can on the way out. So, um, you know. You never know, but but that's what I'm thinking for the one who don't succeed. Yeah, well, I just it occurs to me as you talk there, Andy. One more measurement because um, I know you have to get back to work. Uh, GGT, the liver enzyme. Uh, Dr. David Unwin is having amazing success in the UK. I think you're you're well familiar with him. He uh, used GGT as his cheat metric. So when people came in, their GD, GGT kept going down. The liver inflammation fine and if they came in and he found that their metrics were going bad the ggt had always stalled or gone back up and then they'd often admit well you know i started eating bread again i'm sorry <laughs> oh hey um just curious is the gct the same as the alt no no the a alt and ast are the amino transferases it's gamma glutamyl transferase so GGT, and it's not, it's measured in Ireland as part of the liver uh, panel test, the liver function. But I've noticed in America, it is generally not done in the liver panel. No, it it's not. ASP, I, yeah. I tried to find it the other day. I'm like, whoa, is, is GGT the same as the ALT? And, and so I'm, I haven't gotten to that, that far to dig into it. But um, well, it, I'm going to have to look into it. 
No, you're right, Andy, though. I have seen that that very standard in, in Ireland and maybe the UK, but in America, it's it's very seldom done. It's like ferritin. We do ferritin a lot in Ireland, and it can pick up inflammation, metabolic syndrome, or hemochromatosis, which is common in Ireland. But then ferritins are not so common in America. No, we don't order it a lot, no. That's it. So what next steps then? You're going to just keep doing what you're doing, helping more and more people. I think you're going to Denver Low Carb, the conference, are you? Yes, I am going. Yeah, uh, this Excellent. would be my uh, my my first time traveling out. Uh, I did go to one of the top by... Uh, by Dr. Westman, um, you know, about an hour from where I lived. And then so just kind of get a taste of it. So I'm like, you know, I've been reading lots of books. I read your book. I read Dr. Jason Fung's book and many other doctors' book. And I'm like, well, you know, I think I need to go and just see what they talk about in person. So, and, you know, I also need CME, the right CME, <laughs> that is not just CME. And then so, so I'm going to Denver to... Um, um, to to the low cough conference, uh, like for real, for the first time, and then so. Excellent, Andy. Well, we'll get to meet in person there, which is fantastic. And uh, I have a talk, I think maybe on the Sunday, and also I'm moderating the big debate or panel discussion between Gary Taubes and Darius Mozaferian. Oh. From... So uh, I'll, I'll try and be fair and balanced. Is that what they say about your best news? Uh, corporation in America, fair and balanced, or and I don't know which. Yeah, I haven't watched like the mainstream news for some time because it's quite. Uh, I don't know. It's it's very noisy. Oh, for sure. I I was kind of making a joke about is it is it Fox News have some tagline or phrase about uh, fair and balanced, whereas often they might not be so much. But there you go. Well, listen. That's super. Anything else you want to throw in? Because I know we, we got to get back to work. Sure. Um, the, the, the next thing for my adventure is uh, I'm going to Boston uh, for the obesity conference. Um, I'm, I want to get uh, obesity uh, board certified and then so really work on this, um, um, you know, treating the body the, with, you know, with the right food and then trying to help people to lose the weight the right way and maintain it. And then so... I am board, board certified in family medicine, but obesity medicine, I wasn't. So um, I'm going to try to get board certified in that. That would be my next uh, adventure. Well, you, you just tell them, and it's true, that you're way ahead of most of the obesity specialists in understanding the root causes and how to fix them. And I'm, I'm sure they'll give it to you in no time. Uh, well, I seen a couple of them. They do talk a lot about medicine. So, um, but um, but yeah, I'm gonna fix you know fix about obesity, but probably more food than medicine for sure. So, yeah. Well, Hippoc Hippocrates said food is medicine essentially. So you know that's perfectly valid. That's right. <laughs> Hey, listen, thanks a lot, Andy, and uh, we'll catch up again. But certainly, we'll be catching up in Denver in any case. Absolutely, we'll see you in Denver, Ivor. Great stuff, Andy. Good night. Have a great day. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left. Otherwise, please do subscribe to the audio podcast. Thanks.